So this uh, last little section is going to be probably a little bit shorter. Um, but so Sean asked me to think about what it means to draw from deep wells. Um, and so I'm not thinking so much about, you know, finding really lovely sermon illustrations. We're going to go a bit kind of further back in the process. Um, this is going to be about kind of uh, how we might personally open our eyes to the world around us, to be learners of people and learners of cultures, um, and how to better communicate the truths of scripture within the context that we're living in now. Um, so this is hopefully about kind of going deeper in terms of being more aware of how scripture might resonate to different people at different times and different places, um, but also to ourselves. Um, and there are three ways that I'm going to just quickly look at. Uh, reading more widely, learning from the arts and from creation, and then connecting with world events. So on the handout, you've just got three headings, and if you want to, you can doodle if I'm boring um, and do some art or something. So um, firstly, reading more widely. Um, so just a quick question, uh, with the person next to you, I want you, I know we're not all Anglicans here, um, thank the Lord, and um, <laughs> so um, you're just going to turn to the person next to you and just um, tell them what the average Anglican looks like. So what is their age, what gender are they, and what language they speak, off you go, two minutes. Okay, I wonder what you said, I'm not going to ask you, it's a bit of a trick question, probably many of you already know this. Um, but the Anglican Communion includes between 80 and 90 million members. The average Anglican looks like this. African, female, between the ages of 15 to 20, economically poor and Bible-believing. <laughs> Did I catch anyone out? <laughs> okay. Did, did you get it, Sean? That was a wahoo. Yeah, no, okay, well done. <laughs> um, so, for that reason, it's really important, isn't it, to be reading widely in global theological terms. Um, and probably, I suspect, that when we're doing our Bible studies, when we're looking at the commentaries, we will very naturally be listening to voices that sound like us and think like us and come from our culture. But all the more reason then to spread out our kind of um, reading arms to the world. <laughs> um, so we know the Middle East was the center of Christianity. Now Africa is the most Christian continent, Latin America the fastest growing in terms of Christianity. So cultural diversity is part of the DNA of our faith, which is amazing. Um, and if we think of the early church, Christianity grew and flourished when it crossed boundaries, didn't it? We've just heard we, they crossed over to the other side. Like I was just saying that um, I've heard someone speak about that passage in terms of mission, going over to the other side. Um, and one way to cross boundaries theologically is by hearing voices from other parts of the world. And I think it does four things. It helps us to have a more expansive view of God. So you know when you hear of missionaries across the world and you hear of the stories of God across the world, isn't it encouraging? Because you're like, oh my goodness, it's the same God. <laughs> it's the same God that did this thing for me in my life, and I'm hearing of a testimony across the world. It's encouraging. It helps us to have a humbler view of ourselves. Um, we might gain insights. There's this lovely expression. I wonder if, if you've heard it. It is the guest who sees the leak in your roof. Um, so when I personally look at global, global theology, it's like I'm inviting someone into my house and they're kind of going, pointing out all the cracks in the ceiling that I haven't seen because I'm so used to it. Um, and so when we look at other theologies, when we look at our cultures and we allow them to reflect back to us, it's called deep listening. So we're not just reading it kind of from arm's length, we're allowing it to reflect back at us and teach us things about our life and our lenses and the things that we're not aware of which is really exciting. And finally, it helps us to be more aware of those in our congregations. So we might start to ask questions like this, who is invisible? Who is silent? What perspectives am I missing because of my personal situation in my life, um, because of my upbringing, because of my particular privileges? Do I have any blind spots? Do I sweep people along into my world and my way of seeing the world because I'm just not aware and I'm blinkered? And if you really want to do a deep dive, um, you might want to look at something called intersectionality, um, intersectional theology, which is about um, understanding the layers of identity that we all exist in. Um, so those layers of uh, race, class, gender, those things that shape our experience um, within the kind of institutions and structures of society that we live in. Um, so for me, 
my privileges are that I'm, I am female, I am white, I am educated, I'm Western, I'm employed, I'm able-bodied and so on. And those are my privileges that I exist in. And on the flip side, you know, those might be things that other people don't have. And so they are their disadvantages in life. And it matters because then we understand that our experiences aren't the same as everyone else. Um, we understand that things are nuanced and we might be more thoughtful. We might to start, you know, this passage means this for me, but what about someone who has a completely different background to me? Who, you know, what would that passage resonate to them? Am I missing over, glossing over something really important? So that's a little bit about global theology. And I've put a reading list um, of the kind of basics, kind of beginning, if you want to just begin to think about it. And obviously, like, we might find, we might come across theology that we massively disagree with. And all I'm saying is that's okay to, to just stretch yourself a little bit, just to give yourself an understanding of what's going on in the world around us. And it's okay if we don't completely agree, but just to help us to, again, spread our wings a little bit and understand. Um, I hope that's okay. A bit of a challenge. Um, okay, drawing from the arts and from creation. So, um, the effectiveness of Christianity, this is a quote, the effectiveness of Christianity in our culture has to do with translation and contextualization. <laughs> I think that's a really wordy way of saying that we need to help people connect with their faith um, by connecting them to their lives and their experiences. Um, that was a really wordy quote. Um, so, if we're teaching something like doctrine, um, we, if we're just teaching it as theory divorced from reality or people's lives, we're not helping people to connect. So again, it's all about kind of stepping into other people's shoes and other people's lives and into their reality and helping them connect. Um, and one way to do this is by listening to culture as much as possible. Um, someone once said, if you want to understand a culture or a context or a people or a time, listen to their music, right? So what is music saying right now? Probably quite shocking things. <laughs> but we should be not just cutting ourselves off from it and not divorcing ourselves from it because we don't like it, but actually listening. You know, what's going on? And it's the same with the arts. It's the same with movies. Like, I've just watched a really interesting movie um, which is about the fear of artificial intelligence. And there's all of that going on. And there's lots of apoc uh, apocryphal movies at the moment. Um, Tim did an amazing job with Barbie and um, Oppen... No, what's it called? Oppenheimer, which I still haven't seen. Anyone else seen it? Yeah, like, uh, really powerful stuff, apparently. <laughs> um, and, and again, the, these are the questions being asked by our culture within the movie. So if we think about, you know, back in the day, um, cult people would be telling the stories of their culture through stories they would tell around the campfire or around the dinner table, but now the story is being told on our screens. So we need to be listening. So these are some questions you could ask when you next go to the cinema. And um, on the handout later, we're gonna, you could possibly use this as your kind of questions to chat about. But you're going to think about a movie and you're going to ask these questions. How does the content reflect humanity in its beauty or its brokenness? Sometimes we see things in culture that's just gorgeous, that's amazing. Like the way that um, eyes are being opened to the beauty of creation at the moment. It's really amazing. Um, is there a hope for the future in the movie? Uh, what does the content invite us into? How does it inspire or challenge us in our walk with Jesus? How does it expose culture's collective, collective need of God? That's often in there as well. And we can ask the same question of art as well, and music and fine art, whatever speaks to you. Um, and I'm going to take you on a little journey now. So for me, it's dance. <laughs> Um, and some of you will enjoy this, some of you not, probably not so much, I don't know. Um, but I'm going to show you a one and a half minute clip uh, from a piece of choreography, so sit tight. Um, and this is my favourite choreographer, she's Canadian, and it's called Flight Pattern. And it was created in her response to the um, European migrant crisis, and she created it in 2017. So we're just going to have a quick look at it, see if it resonates with you in any way. Like, what does it make you think about? What does it make you think about in terms of theology? And then I'm going to tell you what it makes me think about. Um, so we're going to have a quick look. Hopefully it'll work. It's a very good video. I do recommend watching the rest of it. Um, so Crystal Pite, flight pattern, about the migrant crisis. Um, and what she spoke there about was her um, kind of 
she was drawn to the idea of liminality, of that in-between state of being stuck between one place and another. Like you've fled an area, you've fled your life, you've fled your home, and now you're kind of stuck. You don't ever know when you're going to get to the other side, when you're going to get to freedom. Will you ever get to freedom? Will you ever get back home? And for me, when I think about that theologically, it says so much. Like the whole Bible is about that state, isn't it? If you look at the Old Testament, you've got that transitional state through the, through the sea into the um, wilderness. And then the wilderness is that transition state and then into the promised land. And then on a big picture, the big scale, we're in that state now, aren't we, as Christians, from the time of Jesus' death and resurrection to the time when he will come again. Um, and so art is speaking about this stuff. Um, culture is speaking about this stuff. The experiences of the world are speaking about um, wanting to get to that place, the promised land and that freedom um, in the end. So art, do you look at art, um, ask questions about art, immerse yourself in it. Um, and then having an eye on the news is the last thing about how we can go deeper um, and be connected to the world within our, our sermon writing as well. So be aware of what's going on locally. Um, Partly that's just to be sensitive as well, because um, when we were doing Habakkuk, um, it was just at the beginning of the, the crisis in Israel and Gaza. And so we had to be so careful when we started preaching about that. Like partly it was pretty amazing that that's where we landed in our sermon series. But also, yeah, we had to be really sensitive. Um, be aware of the things that are driving culture. Um, sometimes we might see or hear things in the news or on the radio that's quite a fun story and it can be a good sermon illustration. So just like keep a note of them. <laughs> like I've got a, a page, uh, a Word document in my computer that's about um, keeping track of those stories. So I'm going to leave it there. And what we're going to do is just think about these things and chat for the last 10 minutes, I think it is, isn't it? Or sh yeah, we'll keep it short. Um, and in this handout, you've got what to do. So in groups, discuss these news stories. And I've written three news stories that you could possibly think about. And what you're going to do is ask the questions. What does the story tell us about the world? How could you connect these stories with your faith? Um, what should the Christian response be? So sometimes it's not very sensitive to make a sermon illustration out of a catastrophe across the world, obviously. But we might start thinking about what our Christian response is. Um, or if you don't want to do that, you could discuss a piece of art, a movie, um, a piece of music that you like of your choice and discuss those points at the end. Um, so I'll leave that with you um, and we'll just spend a few minutes just chatting again. All right.